they have a lot of people come and go, come and go. And our people, we don't have many go. We don't have many go. We've had some people go, but most of the people stay. When my dad saw us go through this whole COVID thing, when we got kicked out of the library, we ended up at the park in the heat. Probably 100 degrees easy at the park. But praise the Lord, we had a little awning, you know, it kept at least the direct sunlight off. I think it warmed up like a stove, though. But you know what? I showed, I showed a picture of our church during that time at the park, and my dad was floored, like, Randy, it looks like all your people are there. And I was just like, yeah, so? He's like, no, Randy, you don't realize, like, we literally lost majority of our people. And I'm like, I kind of went home like thinking about that, like, wow, like our folks are very different, you know? And the reason I named the church that, that was because First Baptist Church of Lancaster, they changed their name to be Grace Chapel. Um, Courts Hill Foursquare, who owns this building, they changed their name to be Hope Chapel. You know, and by Chuck Smith's own words, nobody knows what Calvary Chapel is. And that's in the Calvary Chapel Distinctives released 2001, if you are caring to find that quote. Mm -hmm. You know it. Yeah. <laughs> nobody knows what they are. Every, oh, what about the Four Square Church in Palmdale? No, don't call it the Four Square Church. The Highlands. Yeah. Everybody has an alias name. They're hiding. Wow. That's Marketing 101. Come on. All right? I thought Jesus Christ will build his church and the gates of hell will not prevail, right? They're building their church. That's right. Come on. Under an alias. Now, uh, doctrine divides. Churches ignore it. Pastors won't touch it. Many Christians avoid it. Focusing on doctrine is just not a good marketing strategy to grow a church numerically and physically. Okay? <laughs> I got to try to say this quote right because if it doesn't ring right, it's not going to work. But it's about dividends. <laughs> All right? You know, uh, the cheddar? It, it, they say it like this, right? The cheddar? cheddar? You know, the cheddar. That's what it's about. So doctrine divides. And you know what? You need to think about this doctrine. But doctrine matters, actually. The green, I don't know, yeah. whatever. All right, and then doctrine matters. And the crazy things people do in the name of God, I want to show you right now. And I'm going to, I'm going to prove to you why doctrine matters. And I hope to ring your bell a, a time or two as I, as I tackle this real quick. Doctrine matters and the crazy things people do in the name of God. Being a celibate vegetarian. Huh? A celibate vegetarian? Uh, yeah, people do that as a religious right. Well, who, Randy? The Roman Catholic Church. <laughs> a celibate vegetarian? You ever heard of Lent? Yes. Oh! You, you, you see what I'm saying now? Fish Fridays? Uh, let's go to 1 Timothy 4.3. And let's try the spirits to see whether they be of God. First Timothy 4.3. You know what? Just, just for fun, let's start at verse 1. You know, just get, context always helps, doesn't it? And sometimes it just makes it even more funny. Now, the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith. Wow, we're talking about that. Giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of what? Devils. If your Bible says demons, get a new Bible. Verse 2. Speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron... Read verse 3 now. Forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from meats which God hath created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. So these people, they're forbidding to marry and abstaining from meats and treating it like it's a religious right. 
and and treating you like you're less holy if you got married and you can eat a steak. What? I thought it's not good for man to be alone. Oh, well, if you believe what God said. Oh, man. <laughs> yeah. Oh, man. You know, these mistakes I often make. You know, I just believe what God says. And, oh, how dumb am I? You know, I should have believed in the religious organization and their definition of what it said. Right? Yeah, if you want to be a, a Bible dumbbell. But who would have thought a celibate vegetarian would be blamed on the Bible and God? Nope. Wrong. Cultish. Number two. How about this one? Gentile Sabbath keeping. Amen. Gentile Sabbath keeping. Like who? Well, the Seventh-day Adventists, of course. <laughs> I mean, man, an interesting thing. We've seen, we seen them at Marie Kerr Park. They actually had a track table. I was pumped up. I was like, whoa, Christians with a track table. And I went up and I started talking to them. I'm like, so where are you guys from? They're, oh, we're just some believers. And I'm like, okay, um, that's good, but, you know... Um, so what flavor is your teaching? You know, and essentially I just said, look, identify yourself. Who are you? Oh, well, we're Seventh-day Adventists. And I was like, oh, now it makes sense why you're hiding. Because the Seventh-day Adventists have been exposed a lot. <laughs> you ever heard of Mary, Mary, Baker, Mary Baker Eddy? Yeah. Oh, yeah, research her a little bit. Some false prophetess. But, you know, let's just destroy their whole system with one verse, okay? Actually, it's going to be one, two, three verses. Exodus 31. And you know what? If you knew the Bible, if people knew the Bible, cults like that could not succeed. But because Christians are lazy... And they reject to open the book because that book will cut them when they read it. They don't want to do it. It's not comfortable. Uh, Exodus 31, 12 through 14, it says, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, So you know who Moses was, I hope. He was a prophet to the children of, of what? Israel. Israel. Oh, that, that could tend to be a problem. Verse 13, uh, Speak thou also unto the children of what? Israel, saying, Verily my Sabbaths ye shall keep. For it is a sign between me and you throughout your generations that ye may know that I am the Lord that does sanctify you. Hold your finger there. Go to 1 Corinthians one twenty-two. You guys have been here for a while. You probably wore like a mark on this page. But it, you, you got to know it. 1 Corinthians one twenty-two. Now remember, he said, for it is a sign, okay, between me and you. Sign. That's your key word. 1 Corinthians 1.22, for the Jews require a sign. And the Greeks seek after wisdom. Okay? And uh, is that deep enough there? I, I could go a little further down that road, but I think that just, I think that just nailed it. The Sabbath is not your covenant, Gentile. It's just not. You know what? Oh, oh, I had a good one. Ah, oh, where did it go? Let me see. Maybe it's... <laughs> you, you've always got to read the next verse, guys. Okay? Be careful cutting off those verses because God will play jokes on you. And so if we just kept reading, it says, verse 13, Speak thou also unto the children of Israel, saying, Verily my Sabbath ye shall keep, for it is a sign between me and you throughout your generations, that ye may know that I am the Lord that doth sanctify you. Next verse, 14. Ye shall keep the Sabbath therefore, for it is holy unto you. Everyone that defile it shall surely be put to death. For whosoever doeth any work therein, la, 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 la. So what do you get now? Today... You get Christians saying that they're going to keep the Jewish laws, the Sabbath, but they never practice this one for some reason. 
And if, in case you didn't know about Seven Day Adventists, in case you have like a little bit of love for them, which I know Jesus Christ died for them, amen? They can get saved, okay? But they're going to have to reject their false heresy, amen? But there is no Seven Day Adventist or Messianic Christian, whatever you want to call them, that is going to be willing to follow verse 14. I mean, unless they're just cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs, which, you know what? <laughs> I guess every day there's more and more. But, but this is why doctrine matters. Because you understand there are groups that believe they're the Jews and they're walking into Jewish-owned bagel shops and opening fire. That's why doctrine matters, guys. Doctrine matters. You know, doctrine matters because somebody will fly your children to South America and force them to drink cyanide lace Kool-Aid at gunpoint? That's why doctrine matters. Yes. Amen? Yes. Doctrine matters more than you think. More than you think. This going along to get along? Not anymore, guys. We're too far down the road. And uh, I think I was going to do the tongue speaking. Should we do that one? You guys got time? Tongue speaking? You're like, uh, Randy, you're going to speak in tongues? or, or uh, <laughs> Tongues, uh, uh, let, me, let me put this here. Tongue speaking. Tongue speaking. Uh, we looked at 1 Corinthians one twenty two, and this one just gets destroyed with one verse as well, or two. 1 Corinthians one twenty two in one hand, and then go to 1 Corinthians 14.22 because God knew that you'd need an easy verse to remember in your other hand. So in 1.22, once again, the Jews require a sign. Okay? That's what they're looking for. That's why Moses came with the leprous hand out of his vesture. It was leprous. He put it back. It was healed. It was leprous. It was healed. It was leprous. It was healed. And then he comes and he's splitting the Red Sea. He comes and he's throwing down his, his rod and it turns into a serpent. And he picks up the tail and it's a rod again. He came with the signs. Guess who else came with the signs? The second Moses. Jesus Christ. And he came with the signs. Raising the dead, healing the sick, walking on water. Who was his target people? Come on. Nope. Jews. He came for the Jews first. And when they rejected him, glory, hallelujah, we got in, man. <laughs> we are those barbarians, man. You, you, think, you think about these men? Man, I, my, my kin came from Scandinavia, man. And I mean, oh, it was bad. Yeah, I mean, you, I don't even want to look at the... I got somebody in my, in my family line named Skull Crusher. Okay, that's not good. I don't know what happened to him, but I don't think it turned out too good. But, I mean, man, these are some pagan fools. And, and somehow we got in, man. And, and we know it's to cause them to be jealous, but hey, I'm not arguing, you know. And I got a chance to talk to two Jews yesterday at the table, too. Amen? So, amen. It was good. But for the Jews require a sign. They require it, and God gives it to them, by the way. He gives them what they need. He always have. That's His people. Amen? God the Father's bride. So look now. We're talking about speaking in tongues. Go to 1 Corinthians 14, 22. Wherefore, tongues are for the Gentiles. Do you read that? What's it say? Say? No, it says wherefore, tongues are for a sign. And who are the signs for? Who requires a sign? The Jews. So why do you have Gentile churches without a Jew within 500 miles and they're in there going, la, 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 Randy, did you really just do that in the middle of your service? Yeah, I, I did. <laughs> That's what they do. They do. They're dancing in, in the middle of the aisles and all that and, and they don't even know what they're saying. They could be cursing God for all they know. No interpreter. You, you can, if you care to know, which most Christians don't, just read the whole chapter. Don't read one verse. Read the whole chapter. He'll show you what's right. 
Amen? So tongue, I mean, this is why doctrine matters. You know, Dr. Peacock, he had a, uh, he was a uh, chief of police in Jacksonville, Florida, and they had a case where a lady went to her pastor and started asking the pastor about tongues. And the, and the pastor said, well, you know, I guess it's in the Bible. Anyway, she started getting more and more deeper and deeper into this tongue speaking. And I'm about to blow your mind. And in her journal that she had, she had a journal, they said that as she kind of continued down this road she was going, this tongue speaking, the writing started getting wilder and wilder. And one day, one day, this, uh, I guess, um, this lady's husband called 911. And he said, uh, man, it's, it's intense. Dr. Peacock tells it, he, he was first hand, but um, he says that the husband dials 911 and said, my wife, my wife, they're like, sir, what happened? He said, my wife, my, she stabbed me. She stabbed me. My wife stabbed me. And then on this phone call, he said, no, no, not my baby. Not my baby. And she said, Beelzebub, Beelzebub, Beelzebub. And when the cops finally got there, um, this dead carcass of her baby was in the middle of the living room and she was coming out of the garage with a hammer and nails. And they asked her on the ride downtown, what were you going to do with the hammer and the nails? And somewhere along the line, she came to her senses and realized, what did I just do to my baby? It was a spirit. Doctrine matters. You better be careful what you're thinking about. You better be careful of the imaginations that you're entertaining. Let's go ahead and stand.